All right, so I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, before we kick it off, I might, I, might just, um, I might just do a bit of an introduction, just to say, um, so my name's Darren, I'm the Director of the Lifestyle Medicine Health Research Centre here at Avondale. And we, uh, we, when we have esteemed guests, uh, we actually run this as a bit of a speaker series. And so if you're online with us now in real time, very welcome. And if you are watching this later, we hope that uh, you enjoy this presentation too. This is actually uh, a part, a presentation that's part of one of the units in the postgraduate course in lifestyle medicine here at, at Avondale. Um, and it's actually offered also as a, as a, um, a micro-credential. The lecturer for the unit is Professor Renee, the amazing Professor Renee Bitton. And, uh, and I'll hand it over to her to introduce our speaker for tonight. Thanks, Renee. Thank you so much. Um, good evening. And of course, what's happened is that Darren has totally blown <laughs> the, 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 the point of the slide in the background. So he, I'll pause it to those um, who didn't hear it. Who's going to put their hand up and say, I didn't hear it. Um, who is this in the background and why is it pertinent to tonight's presentation by um, our psychologist, Melinda Veroni? Anybody want to put their hand up and say, I know who this is, the man with the white beard, and it's not Freud from last week. Who is this and why is this pertinent tonight? Now, if you heard it already, yeah, don't um, <laughs> Anybody want to fess up? They heard it this already. Come on, otherwise I'm going to ask uh, you questions. I heard it for sure. I think it's Pavlov, isn't it? It is, Lauren. It is. And why is it pertinent tonight? Um, I don't know. It's got. It's like the phenomenon of dogs salivating when they see food, kind of thing, isn't it? Yes. So, the point I of don't, this, yeah. Well, maybe tonight this is the whole point. We'll have Melinda. Veroni, our specialist, our psychologist um, who specialises in tobacco treatment, who's going to introduce herself in a moment, explain why this is so pertinent to um, her presentation tonight. So as a, as a segue to this, welcome, Melinda, and thank you so very much for doing this presentation. In a, as we go through this tonight, we'll, um, we'll be discussing some cases, and you can think of, if you can, participants live um, what you might be thinking is there somebody I've seen who could um, fall into some of the categories that um, Melinda's going to talk about and we can talk about that later this evening uh, towards the end of the presentation so thank you Melinda and I'll, I'll leave it to Melinda to introduce herself thank you Thanks very much. Thanks, Renee. Thank you, Darren. Thanks, Mel. Hello, everyone, and um, welcome. It's great that you're here this evening. It's actually quite, I always feel quite inspired when I do some lecturing on um, nicotine addiction and most importantly, treatment, because it tells me that I think people are getting the message that this is, continues to be a real problem, um, particularly with uh, Indigenous health and, and just in general. I mean, we've had a huge reduction in smokers in, in general, but we've still got a little way to go. So thank you all of you for doing this micro-credentialing and I, and I really hope you go out there and um, do some great work. Um, I've been doing psychology for some time. I mentioned earlier that Renee and I met at the, um, the Neuro Labs of Sydney University back in 1996, which is a while ago. Uh, and we've, uh, we've since collaborated on different levels. We've uh, worked together in establishing the Australian Association of Smoking Cessation um, um, specialists um, and I've been giving some guest lecturing uh, in terms of this certification since about 2010. My area is a specialty in psychology, addiction and personality uh, and that's all addictions uh, including nicotine and so tonight we're going to be talking about the behavioural aspects of addiction as it pertains to nicotine uh, addiction treatment uh, specifically and uh, as we go through you'll learn why uh, Renee so astutely put up a background as Pavlov and his poor dogs um, uh, as we move on. So I'm going to share my slides with you. Um, and I'm hoping that everyone can see that. Is that coming up for you? Excellent. Thanks, Mel. 
All right, so we're going to be looking at the behavioural aspects um, and acquisition, maintenance and relapse of nicotine addiction. I hope to have most of this done within the hour. It's not going to be too intensive. I'm assuming a fair bit of knowledge. So bear with me if I'm repeating something. It won't be for too long and we'll get into the more nitty gritty. Normally this component of my uh, lecture has is usually face to face and we have a section where you all get to actually look at a case study as a small group and come up with treatment formulations, which is usually lots of fun. It means you're putting some of the knowledge that you're learning into practice, uh, but that won't happen this evening um, simply because it's still too hard to do via Zoom. So let's commence. All of you know the definition of substance abuse and dependency. Um, so if it's just these slides are available, I think, Mel, on the learning portal so you're welcome to go back and have a look at that i'm not going to go through these slides in detail because you should already know what this looks like you should already know what the definition of abuse and dependency uh, is so in knowing that it can be any substance object or behavior that became a major focus of a person's life of course to the major exclusion of other activities and importantly activities of daily life and they usually start to cause harm to the individual and that can be anything I often say to people if you have a brain you can become addicted if you have enough neural circuitry you can become addicted so it's important to recognize that addiction is not a bad habit we do work within the medical model of that we do see it as a disease disease of choice if you will but it is a disease and a person can become addicted dependent or compulsively obsessed with pretty much anything. And I've got a few examples here. Usually I get people to yell them out, but I will just go through them. Exercise, some of you may be familiar. Food, types of sexual activities, high-risk hobbies, the internet, that's a new one. Gaming, we're seeing that a lot more. Uh, colours, inanimate objects, and so much more. And, uh, you know, in terms of the internet, um, you know, internet shopping uh, and so forth. So... I do have on occasion a couple of uh, funny little um, cartoons just to bring a little bit of light humour to everything. So one thing, the only thing I want you to remember as we go through this lecture is just in the back of your mind, this particular bit of information. The acquisition and relapse stages of any kind of addiction have psychological factors that affect them. And they are critical to understanding the triggers of relapse and facilitating sustained remission or abstinence, for example. So it's all about the influence of the tendency to experiment with these particular drugs and so forth. And of course, the modulating reward impact, neurally speaking, that occurs as a result of repeated tendency to experiment. Just have that, as you know this, again, just have that in the, in the back of your mind as we go through this lecture, because it will help to make a bit more sense. Now, Bear with me, this is just a small video that I like to play. So we're just going to get up to speed in the neurobiology. I'm just going to stop the share for a moment in order for me to play this, uh, this video. I just need to access, um, hang on, tick, where am I? Okay. Uh, now, can everyone see that clearly? Excellent. The dopamine neurons send their reward processing up. They project from the VTA to the NA, and then... <clears throat> to the frontal cortex. Now the frontal cortex becomes involved. It sends glutamate neurons back down to the midbrain. As the brain generates an experience of pleasure, the neurons going up release dopamine. And the neurons going down release glutamate. Normally, this up and down communication enables the brain to recognize and learn those things in the environment that are good for survival. Dopamine says, hey, this is important. Glutamate says, okay, I'll remember. 
Dopamine says, hey, I really want this. Glutamate says, fine, go and get it. That's the way this elegant but delicate system was meant to work for food, for sex, for Madeline cookies. Drugs go straight to this mechanism and wipe it out. These surges of neurochemicals are like flash floods tearing through the landscape of the brain. Each use of the drug, every flash flood, ravages the brain's delicate physiology, sweeping away everything in its path. With time, deep channels are carved into the brain. Drug pathways become stronger and stronger, Normal pathways become weaker and weaker. Dr. Stephen Hyman of Harvard University calls addiction a pathological overlearning of the drug and all that goes with it. This isn't a normal memory. This is a drug hypermemory, and these memories may be permanent. They leave the addict vulnerable to relapse even after years of abstinence. Trying to get back onto my slides. This is all very technical. Are we back there, Mel? Lovely. Yeah. Thank you. So one thing I want you just to recall is the term hypermemory, that the combination between dopamine and glutamate is such that whenever there is a particular stimuli uh, that releases large amounts of dopamine and then glutamate. Uh, plays a role in remembering everything, you've got a massive hypermemory of that event. Now, on the savannah, that would have served us quite well because we would remember where all the saber tooth were, where the right or clans were, and where the danger zones were, including where we'd find water, food, and um, friendly clan members. Unfortunately, when you deal with teratogens of uh, drug types such as nicotine, the uh, release of dopamine is. Uh, very high and so that same system is hijacked and of course there's an alert that goes to the brain and says this is important this is significant we've just had a very high release of dopamine and then glutamate says don't worry I've taken a 360 degree photograph of everything and I'll remember everything about that and herein lies the I guess the base of the lecture this evening uh, when you are treating people with any kind of addiction and um, specifically tonight we're talking about nicotine addiction you will actually be dealing with their hyper drug memory and that means you'll be dealing with every part of the environment that gets um, taken in as a, as a glutamate memory whenever they smoke a cigarette and this is where it can become quite complex it's not as, as simple as detoxing if it was simple as detoxing we wouldn't have relapse so just a summary of the video clip again is in the slides there for you. Um, I'm not going to go through them. I just want you to re remember that dopamine is about telling the brain that there is a stimuli that is better than expected. And as a result, it wants to remember that. And it assigns value to that particular um, um, teratogen as a release, the dopamine. And then glutamate says, okay, I'm going to remember that. I'll make sure that I have all the details of that particular event on hand and ready for next time. So if you just sort of remember that as we move along, and again, remembering that when it comes to the combination of these two particular neurotransmitters, you're looking at a hyper memory for the drug and everything associated with it. And this is where things can become quite um, problematic in terms of relapse recovery and problematic in terms of treatment uh, because we're now dealing with another um, element of addiction. It's not just the neural pathways that are forged as mentioned in that video, but it's all these snapshot pictures, what we call cues that have been uh, taken as a result. And these cues are very, very important when it comes to a person going into sustained remission. So this evening, we're going to be talking about that, the, I guess, the role that glutamate plays in addiction. So we're going to be looking at the reason that Renee, in fact, has that, that little picture in the back is because we're looking at 
the good old classic learning and associations that take place when a person is uh, becomes addicted to a substance simply because of the play and the interplay of the neurotransmitters that get released at the time. So the accelerative mechanisms of any learning or associations are when you basically pair a conditioned stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus, and there is a time interval of 0.05 seconds, that I guess is the witching time, by which there is a, um, I guess, a message of the brain that says this is important. And unfortunately, nicotine and the way that it's administered uh, meets that criteria very nicely. That means that that dopamine releases within its interval time and everything is paired around the environment along with the release of dopamine and, um, and glutamate makes sure that the brain remembers everything. So it's a highly addictive substance as a result. Uh, of course, we've seen that in, in the people that we've dealt with. Uh, but it also means that because it's a, a legal substance, it means that the pairing of glutamate means that, that the environment by which people smoke is much greater than, say, a person using illicit substance. So we've got a, a greater uh, problem in trying to expose them um, to their different cues and actually help them to actually go into sustained remission, which I'll talk about a little bit further down the line. So just remembering that nicotine, unfortunately, meets this particular criteria, making it highly addictive as a result. Um, I don't think I need to talk about Pavlov's dogs. I think all of you understand conditioned and unconditioned stimuli. Um, but the take home message uh, is really just to, to understand that the presynaptic synaptic transmission rate of 0 0.05 seconds meets that criteria. Um, and that becomes dependent on learning. And that learning is, uh, initiates long-term potentiation and uh, that memory goes very deep into the brain. All right, so I'm not sure if have you mentioned West already. Rena? I haven't mentioned Robert West before. Yeah, go ahead. So if we look at the um, stimulus impulse association cycle of West 2010, then you can see where the release of dopamine and glutamate acts to create some very strong cue conditioning for cigarette smoking. So you've got the situation in which you've smoked, you've got the act of smoking itself, you've got the nicotine actually being absorbed, and then you've got the dopamine release and the glutamate um, causing that cycle to continue. So you have very strong situational cues as well as just the cigarette itself. So this becomes a, a, a real problem when it comes to uh, sustained remission. Here are some of the definitions that I've listed down as, I guess, uh, the learning as I relate to nicotine specifically. So you've got the reinforcer. So you've got the cigarette smoke uh, to get the nicotine delivery. That obviously strengthens responses. You've got the reward, of course, which is the enjoyable effects of the drug, the neurotransmission activity. You've got the incentive. Um, so this acts as a premise that direct attention is, is you know, you're going to actually try to um, acquire this particular uh, external agents such as smelling smoke or seeing someone smoking. Motivation, of course, is that they then, you know, people will uh, allot a huge amount of um, cognitive and physical energy and behavioural resources to make sure that um, they can predict getting their cigarettes and making sure that they get their reward. Even if, uh, as we've seen it, we've seen that in terms of people going without other necessary means to do that. And incentive motivation or responding. Basically, where you're very motivated uh, in terms of external um, stimuli, we call this a drive state. So this is where the, the drive state and the seeking out of this particular substance can drive a person to uh, forego all other things to make sure that they can actually get hold of the substance for the purposes of that neural reward. I just need to stop sharing again. So, very tiring, really. Um, and... What I've got here is a little bit of comic relief, but it's an excellent uh, small three-minute video uh, of um, Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory um, actually using this learning technique uh, in a bid to make Penny a more tolerable individual. And it's actually quite nicely done. Um, and I like uh, the idea of a bit of novelty in terms of learning. So bear with me as I share this. That didn't work. Can you see that now? Yeah. We can see it, yep. Thank you. 
Are you finished? Well, thank you. How thoughtful. Would you like a chocolate? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> what was that? You said be nice to Penny. I believe offering chocolate to someone falls within the definition of nice. It does, but in my experience, you don't. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Yeah, now that's you, obnoxious and insufferable. <laughs> oh, sorry, Sheldon, I almost sat in your spot. Did you? I didn't know this. Have a chocolate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> What's this cartoon called again? Oshikuru Demon Samurai. <laughs> it's not a cartoon, it's anime. Anime. You know, I knew a girl in high school named Anime. Anime Fletcher. <laughs> She was born with one nostril. Then she had this bad nose job and basically wound up with three. <laughs> You're here a lot now. Oh, am I talking too much? Oh, I'm sorry. Zip. Thank you. Chocolate? Hey, Kim. Yeah. I... You know what? Hold on. Let me take this in the hall. You'll never get to the guy to replace you. Okay. I know what you're doing. Really? Yes. You're using chocolates as positive reinforcement for what you consider correct behavior. <laughs> Very good. Chocolate? Sheldon, you can't train my girlfriend like a lab rat. Actually, it turns out I can. Well, you shouldn't. There's just no pleasing you, is there, Leonard? You weren't happy with my previous approach to dealing with her, so I decided to employ operant conditioning techniques, building on the works of Thorndike and B.F. Skinner. Yet by this time next week, I believe I can have her jumping out of a pool, balancing a beach ball on her nose. No, this has to stop now. I'm not suggesting we really make her jump out of a pool. I thought the bazinga was implied. I'm just tweaking her personality. You're sanding off the rough edges, if you will. No, you're not sanding Penny. Are you saying that I am forbidden from applying a harmless, scientifically valid protocol that will make our lives better? Yes, you're forbidden. Bad, Leonard. <laughs> All right, I hope you found that a little bit enjoyable. I like to have a little bit of a laugh in between. Novel experiences help you to learn more. So that's me trying to facilitate your learning this evening. So although a slightly different type of learning, nonetheless, it's all about um, conditioned and unconditioned um, stimuli and the pairing of those two and how the brain learns by repeated pairing. So when you look at addiction um, and you look at the, the level of neurotransmission activity between dopamine and glutamate, it's extremely high. That hyperdrug, um, the, the drug hypermemory, I should say, is incredibly potent. Uh, and so you're dealing with, uh, you know, millennial old uh, neural circuitry. So it's really important just to have that in mind when you're actually treating a person with nicotine addiction. So we're now going to move on to that area that we've just been talking about. That is when you've got those paired stimuli and you've got them being paired on a regular basis and you've got lots of dopamine activity taking place more than usual. And as a result, the brain's saying, this is important. I might need to take notice of this. And glutamate saying, don't worry, I'll do that for you. Then you're setting up what we call cues. And those cues is absolutely 
anything that is around and associated with the drug at the time. So it can be any person, place, situation, context that has been strongly paired or associated within that 0 0.05 second association with smoking tobacco. So when you stop and just take a moment and have a look at that, that can become quite substantial when you think, um, wow, you know, people pretty much uh, can smoke, you know, not as much where they used to, but they can still smoke in their cars, unfortunately, but they'll smoke at home. They may smoke outside, but when you think about the level of um, visual and auditory stimuli that's occurring around them at the time when they're smoking, that's a lot of cues that are being set up, unlike an illicit substance, which is often done in more secret. So the cues just tend to be less in number, not necessarily less in, in, in terms of association, but just less in number. So a cue, as a result, when it is stumbled across, when, it, you know, when a person comes across an established cue, an established associated cue, then it causes an incredibly strong neural desire to smoke again. We call that a drive state. It triggers off a, a neural drive state because it says, aha, that's right, I remember that and I want that. So and that's why we have relapse. That's the reason we have relapse. All right, you've got several kinds of environmental cues, uh, cues I should say. One of them is environmental, um, and that is that the environmental factors around you are associated with the smoking. They can be very sophisticated and some of them almost undetectable if they have been present in, you know, during repeated times. So it takes a little bit of interviewing and discussing with the individual to really find out what those cues are. Here's a couple of examples of the environmental cues that Renee and I would come across on a regular basis. Um, answering the phone, there's a lot of people, you know, go outside with their phone and they, uh, they're either on their phone talking or text messaging or looking at their phone while smoking. Sitting down at a desk, watching television for those that smoke within the house, although that's, that is less these days. And starting the car, quite a little number of people who still smoke, um, still actually smoke within their own vehicle because it's a private space. So we find that even just um, the sound of a car unlocking or, or the handling of a car key, in fact, can actually trigger off a drive state for smoking. There's also chemical cues, and these can be um, in incredibly powerful and can, in fact can have a delayed effect. Uh, so this is where you know people who are, are Quitting smoking, it's very challenging if they're living or, or seeing someone that smokes because you've got that passive smoking that can occur. Uh, and that's basically the, the I guess, the, the nicotine dense, uh, particle dense uh, breath that comes out that's been exhaled through the nose and the mouth. And of course, the side stream, which is quite potent. So someone just simply holding a cigarette and it's burning off on a side stream. I often say to people, if, you, if you're walking past smokers, take a nice deep breath hold on to it for a while and then breathe out once you've passed them because you're actually taking in those small nicotine particles and you don't want to be doing that to your brain. So when you're teaching a person to or you're trying to get them into remission or sustained remission, and that's the whole purpose of, of relapse recovery, they're going to have potential relapses. You want to get them into as much sustained remission as possible. You need to have discussions with them about these chemical cues and the fact that they can have delayed effects as well. So it's important to determine both these chemical and environmental cues so that you can develop a treatment plan accordingly. There's some other chemical cues that I think Renee will talk about or has talked about, but you've got caffeine. So these have a synergistic, nicotine has a synergistic effect with these particular chemical cues. Uh, chocolate, or cocoa, energy drinks, um, alcohol, and of course, um, the synergistic effect of, of insulin and blood glucose and eating. Uh, so again, you want to be aware of these because you need to be asking all these questions. So here's an example of uh, what I often see, in fact, um, having established mental health inpatient units, both public and private, and having worked in them and dealing with the mental health um, cohort uh, that, do, that still smoke quite substantially. Um, Let's say that you've got a particular patient who, you know, on a regular basis when they're not in hospital, um, goes to a particular coffee shop that's near home, they get a cup of coffee and they have a cigarette with that coffee and that individual goes into hospital. What usually happens is, is that they will receive some level of replacement therapy, 
they're restricted in where and when they can smoke, but they kind of find it a little easy. And the reason being is because they actually haven't ever smoked in a hospital before, so they haven't got any cues there. They haven't actually made any associations. So if we manage their, um, uh, I guess for one better term, if you, if you, if you, if you manage their cravings um, in terms of um, that word is completely gone out of my mind at the moment. So. Excuse me, I've been at this all day. Um, so what happens is if, 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 we, if we manage the, um, the levels of blood nicotine but by way of replacement therapy, most people can say, you know, this isn't too uncomfortable. I'm kind of managing this. I'm not wanting to smoke as much. I'm smoking less than I usually do. And I'm finding this relatively comfortable. And the reason being is because, um, you know, we, we are managing withdrawal and they have no cues within the hospital. They don't usually smoke in the hospital bed. They're not smoking uh, inside the rooms. But what happens is we usually find the individual then start to smoke less. They then leave the hospital. And the instant they're back in their usual environment, they get up, they go past that coffee house that they usually go to, and they instantly get a very strong uh, drug-seeking drive. And invariably, they go back into relapse. They'll go to the nearest shop buy the next packet they can and start smoking pretty much at the rate that they were smoking prior to going to hospital. So this is how the, the, it's important to actually acknowledge cues in addiction because they are predominantly the reason that people relapse and we don't pay them enough attention. We expect to give, uh, we expect to just manage withdrawal states. We're not managing those neural cue states. So this is about, I guess, introducing you to this so that there's an extra level uh, to your treatment planning when it comes to sustained remission of nicotine addiction. Another little funny cartoon. All right. So there's two types of, um, I guess, relapse potentials with tobacco dependency. You have the short term, which I've just spoken about, and that is your nicotine withdrawal. That, you know, if your person goes into acute withdrawal, they're going to pick up again. And the longer term is that we're then not managing any of the, the cues, they're getting cue triggers, and that leads to a huge drug-seeking drive state that is very, very difficult to manage. They're likely to relapse. So as a result, you need to actually look at both of these particular um, areas and, and have some treatment plan uh, in place to help this individual gain sustained remission. In relation to, um, you know, I guess, remission and relapse. When it comes to addiction, it can be highly demoralizing for people when, you know, they're just constantly in and out of this revolving door of addiction and relapse. And as professionals, we need to really be responsible and make sure that we're, we're putting in as best a treatment plan as we can so that these people can avoid going through, you know, these, these relapses. When you speak to most um, people who are suffering from addiction, the, most of the time they don't like the addiction, they don't wish to be addicted, it's all about the neural states of addiction and when they particularly relapse, they can have those the psychological um, challenges and trauma that can occur with that. So as health professionals, we just need to be very mindful that there are many layers to, to treating addiction and, um, and, and just sort of go in there knowing, look, you know, so long as I have a, a, a wider net, I'm likely to help this person a little bit more than just simply giving them uh, you know, some kind of replacement therapy and sending them on their merry way. So how do we do that? So first and foremost, we need to understand that there are these cues in the environment. They're very subtle. They can be almost undetectable, but the brain is has associated them quite um, nearly deeply with the, the use of the drug. And so we need to now actually use the good old classical extinction process to unpeer, basically, what has been peered and each cue needs to be done individually. So when we're actually going to sort of, I guess, reverse um, associate and for any of the, anyone who's familiar with this process, it will take time. But the gold standard at the moment is graded exposure. Um, there is some virtual reality coming out at the moment, uh, but still being measured in its clinical significance. Uh, so the gold standard is systematic desensitisation or graded exposure. Um, and again, it's looking at 
um, your bottom up processing. So it's unpairing the unconditioned stimulus with the conditioned stimulus over a period of time so that the neural pathway starts to, um, I guess, fade, for want of a better term, and you're building a new associated pathway, which is having a cup of coffee without a cigarette, for example. So as a practitioner or someone who's helping a person cease smoking, not only do you need to understand the replacement therapy and any of the uh, pharmacotherapy that occurs in terms of withdrawal, you need to also establish an understanding of the Q hierarchy that this individual has, um, has built up over the years of, of smoking. It will take time. And this is one of the things that can be challenging and um, can, I guess, be the unattractive part of addiction treatment because it takes a fair bit of effort from us and it takes a huge amount of effort from the individual as well. And so this is where, you know, this is where um, we, can, we can lose that individual and they can, they can relapse simply to the energy it takes to actually do this. So we need also be aware that it takes time, but it is so important for sustained remission. Without doing it, we're actually setting this individual up for a relapse. So it's remembering that, that, that the previously learned responses, which is the pairing of the conditioned and unconditioned stimuli, creating a cue is reduced when the cue is presented repeatedly in the absence of the previously paired aversive, unpleasant or ap appetitive pleasant stimulus. An example of that would be, we're now going to have a person have a cup of coffee repeatedly without a cigarette whatsoever. We're gonna have a person have a glass of alcohol repeatedly without a cigarette or without any nicotine. Um, or replacement therapy, yes, but certainly not in inhaling. Um, we'll have a person you know, drive their vehicle to work, for example, no smoking in the car whatsoever. And this happens repeatedly. You know, so over that re re repeated, it's, it's, the, it's in the repetition that we start to break down that cue and that's where it can become time consuming and very tiring uh, for the individual as well, as well as the, the therapist. So um, one of the things that, that we're now, and I think we've, I was just gonna introduce this very, very quickly as a segue to next week, you're looking at some of your um, uh, psychopharmacology. One of the things that we're now actually looking at is using assisted exposure treatments. Uh, I mean, back in the day, there, there's some very good studies on um, beta blockers and, 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 and trauma reframing and exposure. Um, so affecting the central nervous system in a way that it blankets it so that um, the brain does more rapid rewiring and, and more rapid extincting of cues. We're now looking at the use of um, CBD oil uh, in that as well, and it's proving to show quite a bit of promise in that it, you know, the, as I said earlier, the, the challenge is that that re repeated breaking down of those two stimuli can be pretty time consuming and can be exhausting to both the individuals doing it. And we're now seeing some, um, some great, um, uh, I guess, trends in the use of these um, assisted treatments where we're halving that time. And that's good news for the individual, very much so. Um, normally at this point, with this information on board, everyone breaks out into their little groups and we give them some case studies and in there's a bit of information about uh, the, the way that a per well, where a person is smoking and the way that they're smoking and their time to first cigarette and so forth. And as a little group, you gather together and work out what their cues might be and things of consideration and what NRT might I need to be considering here and what kind of uh, cue exposure might I have to you know, implement in this treatment plan, which is very hard to do on Zoom. But what I do have available for you that I've sent off to, uh, to Melanie Renfrew is my cue extension treatment formulation PDF, which you are welcome to, to um, reproduce uh, with citation. But in that, this is kind of what you need to be looking at when you're dealing with the individual. You need to be knowing what they, I think you've done yeah. time to first cigarette, Renee, I'm hoping. Yep. Mm. Uh, time to finish cigarettes. So you're looking at the, the topography, how they smoke, you know, whether they really takes them a, a minute to, to finish an entire cigarette or not. Their hemoglobin. looking at what kind of NRT plan, um, in addition to um, any pharmacology that's in place, any medications that you need to consider. Uh, as well, which you'll cover next week in terms of the effects of 
reduced plasma nicotine and how they can affect some psychopharmaceuticals. Uh, and then you'll be having to identify your chemical environmental cues. Can you still see that? I'm getting a message, my internet's unstable. Okay. Um, and so this is just sort of a, a prompting for you to sit down and start to formulate a treatment plan that is probably more likely to help that individual to go into sustained remission. Um, uh, and so it's looking at uh, Can I just interrupt you for a second, just to let you know that they do have a, a, a questionnaire, uh, which contains most of these. Yes. Uh, already because they'll be doing as part of their um, assessment an evaluation okay. and treatment plan so I'm just pointing this out they know um, or hopefully have looked at this already somewhat just pointing it out that uh, that if you remember that assessment questionnaire they've got they've got that already um, I'm just just reiterating that for them too that you've already got on the blue sheet everybody you've got um, an assessment questionnaire which contains a great deal of this information already. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. No, that's all right. So feel free to use this if you wish. I mean, I, I this is kind of what I do whenever I have a, um, a patient that comes in for smoking cessations. It prompts you to make sure that you are covering all angles and think about all the different things that you actually need to consider when doing a treatment formulation. Uh, and of course, it also prompts you to make sure that you have some kind of, ex, you know, that you actually set up an exposure hierarchy, that you actually track it out in terms of weeks, days, hours, and minutes in terms of the exposure and how you then track the extinction process. Um, and that's where it can be time consuming and a little bit exhausting, but well worth doing for this, for the individuals that are involved because it helps them to actually, as I keep saying, going to sustain remission, which is the entire point of any kind of addiction treatment. Um, so that's available on the learning portal. Um, that is the end of my discussion this evening. Oops, let me just go back to. Thank you. Uh, I think, am I no longer sharing now? Has that worked? Okay. Good, All we're right. good. I said I'd get through it in under an hour. There's a lot of assumed knowledge, so I wasn't going to repeat uh, what you've already learned, but more importantly, just introduce you to the importance of the associations that get built up with, um, with the pairing of dopamine and glutamate and specifically with nicotine addiction. And so it's just, it, it hopefully has just expanded your view a little bit on what you need to be looking for when you're actually treating these people. It's extremely important or you'll be you know, setting them up for a relapse, which is unfortunate. So now it's discussion time I think. Yes right. questions from anybody at the moment and then we might just um, I might posit a case to you of somebody I've seen and um, but before I start has anybody got anything that's troubling them? Questions you might want to ask Melinda. Everybody happy? Uh, I might ask a question Renee. Of course. Um, and Melinda, just talking more about the Q hierarchy. So, um, is it so when you're so it's the person themselves that will be able to distinguish when what their hierarchy is, like when it's most important for them to smoke. Yeah. Like, how is it that that's determined? Yeah, look, it'd be in a collaborative effort. You would, you know, not everyone's aware of or, or necessarily taking notice of the stuff that they're doing when they're actually smoking. So it'd be a collaborative and that you'd be asking questions. Tell me about what you do, where you go, where you're sitting, is anyone with you? Where do you, you know, do you smoke at home? You know, are you in the car? So you'd, you'd want to actually get them to paint a picture and then you would take note of, you know, as you're listening to that, some of the, the cues that you feel have been established and in talking to them, uh, they'll also, you know, better identify a couple of them. They'll say, for example, you know, I can't have a cup of coffee without a cigarette or, you know, I have this energy drink I'm always going to have, you know, with a cigarette. So they'll identify some, uh, but they want to identify all. That's kind of up to you to do a bit of digging in the initial instance when you do the interview with them. And how do you determine the level of importance? Well, I mean, again, that's collaborative. You, you, you would... I guess like any kind of hierarchy exposure, you want to start with the smallest one 
and expose them and build up to the one that they would put down and say, they might say, look, the, the hardest thing for me is coffee. Mm. You know, it's extremely hard for me to not have or even think about a cigarette with a cup of coffee. So we identify that as being one of the stronger cues. We wouldn't necessarily go for that immediately because that can be quite distressing. Mm. So any graded exposure hierarchy, you would, I guess, prioritise. And again, working with, with the individual in terms of their comfort level as well. And you start at the bottom and that's that bottom up and you can mm. work your way up. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Please don't feel uncomfortable about asking some of the- Yeah, I've, I've got a question, Renee. Yes, please. Um, with the extinction of the queue, how does it differ between individuals? Like how many times they'd have to have a coffee without a cigarette for it to reduce? Or is it is it a hundred times, a thousand times? Yeah, good question. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, um, it can vary slightly, but uh, but you'd be looking at, you know, realistically, seven to twelve times when people will start to report that it's less uncomfortable, it's less distressing, they're able to sit with it longer, um, and in, in any kind of graded exposure, we would build up the time of exposure as well. So we'd get them, uh, you know, we're going to do this for ten minutes, and then we're going to do it for fifteen, and then we're going to do it for for 20 minutes and we, we, we build up that level of, of um, tolerance for them as well. Um, so that you can see where it can be a very lengthy process if they've got quite a number of prominent cues, you're looking at weeks and weeks of exposure. Um, and unfortunately that's, that's the challenge, that's where we tend to, um, you know, we'll get midway and there'll be a relapse or, you know, we're starting again. It's a very, very challenging process. Um, but uh, no, the good news is it's not hundreds or thousands, <laughs> unfortunately. But um, yeah, look, and there's, there's not a huge amount of individual difference. You know, um, biologically speaking, most people will say within about seven to 12 um, fairly decent exposures that they'll say they've got a little bit more comfort. It doesn't mean that they've um, uh, fully unpaired, but there's not, not as challenging for them it's not as distressing because it can be very distressing a dry state for a drug can be a very distressing uh, neurological experience to have so we need to be mindful of, of that as well uh, uh, yeah kate's got another question yes sure. um melinda what about getting people to do a smoking diary i've looked for a few templates but haven't seen anything have you got something that you use for getting to people to sort of objectively look at their smoking habits? Well, there's not, not a template per se. I find that there's a real mix. Some people just want to use the te technology on their phone and they'll keep a little diary for themselves. Others um, are using like a voice recording, uh, whilst the, um, the older generation's happy to take a, a piece of paper and pen. Uh, all I ask um, and as a result of that, we, we, you know, we have a lot of varied media by which they want to record it. All I ask is that they just do so kind of at the time and not try and reflect back at 10 o'clock in the evening because that's, their memory is not going to, to serve them well. So really the rule of thumb is I don't mind how they keep their diary, but it needs to be um, uh, very timely within a few minutes of having had the, the cigarette and they can record then thoughts, emotions, location and other things that you'll need to help them along. Okay, well, I'd like to just give you a case of somebody I saw and um, it, was, so it was a middle-aged lady, had a long history of smoking and had um, quite commonly it's a common situation, her best friend and herself. She, her best friend was a smoker and she, this was absolutely her best friend. Now this isn't for you, Melinda, this is for the students. We'll get them to have a think about what would, what would you do? So here's this lady with her best friend. So what she had done in the past every time was I'm gonna, I've got to get, give up smoking. I've got to give up smoking. So she does it She and her, her idea intuitively and a lot of people do this Here's my best friend. She's a smoker. The best thing I can do is say, look, sweetie, I can't see you for 
three months or something. They set up this time limit. I'm going to not see you for three months because you're a terrible influence on me. Better not see you. And when three months are up and I've established myself as a non-smoker, we'll meet up again. What do you think? So they make this arrangement, and this is really common. This is intuitively what people will do. Better not see my friend. Okay, don't see my friend. Three months later, she walks in the door, and this lady has not smoked for three months. And sure enough, the, the lady comes in the door, her best friend, <laughs> dying for a cigarette. She hasn't had that for three months not dying for a cigarette, not an urge to smoke, nothing. Best friend turns up. What would you advise them to do? Students, what would you advise them to do? Given what you've learned tonight, what are we going to do? What can we say that would be valid? It's Sue here. I'm just thinking after tonight, it's probably exposure. So... She should Please. keep seeing this friend, but maybe in a spot where they can't smoke. Correct. So that's exactly that. And how frequently can we do that? Well, you can do that as often as you always met up. And if they met up once a week for a cup of coffee, you go to the cafe where you're not allowed to smoke anymore. So you meet your friend. And so, as I said earlier, it's rather counterintuitive, isn't it? The the intuitive response to these things is I'll ban it I won't have coffee I won't have I won't all these triggers I'm going to avoid them and it's counterintuitive but avoidance actually doesn't treat the problem cue this exposure that's what we call this cue exposure desensitizes you to this and sure enough this will exactly doing that was able to learn how to be with her friend um, as life went on. And she's now learnt how to behave with her friend in a routine and normal manner. And that's what we've learnt with these um, Q exposure uh, treatments is that, um, like Melinda was saying, avoidance or going to a place where there are no cues typically a hospital everybody says how is it that this patient could not smoke all the time they were in hospital and the day they walked out the door this is you know how about our cardiac and respiratory cases they do exactly that they walk out the door and within milliseconds they're dying for a cigarette and smoking again and haven't done it the whole hospitalization and and everybody thinks it's the hospitalization they weren't well enough no, it's not. It's the cue. There aren't any cues there to smoke. They haven't established any of that. And as soon as they go to areas where they've established it, this is my normal thing. It's it's they go into the you know front door of their home, bang, it's all on again. And so the moral to the story for me, um, for Melinda's story, is um, learn how to behave in your normal environment. Learn how to be where things normally would be your cues. If you go to a health resort to quit smoking, which people do, and it sounds great, and they pay a lot of money, and they think this is, this is it. I'm never smoking again. Isn't this great? How many people relapse after they come home? It's traditional that they relapse because they haven't learnt anything. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, in... in it what you're doing is is you're not actually breaking down any of those super neural highways of association. If they just simply, you know, they've just had no reason to activate. There's been nothing in their environment to activate them. And, you know, when they do, as I said, it's an incredibly uncomfortable situation for the body to be in. And, um, it, you know, it, it really, it's a battle you're not going to win. So traditionally and counterintuitively, a lot of people say, look, you know what, just stay away from that pub or stay away from that area or stay away from and that's okay you know for the very very early stages of recovery but at the end of the day we've kind of got to we've really got to push that person into their everyday situations you know we have to start unpairing because um as Renee is pointing out the cues are incredibly powerful and if they're not dealt with 
then we're simply just setting up individuals for relapse. It's, it's an incredibly powerful drive state. It's part of a, a mechanism that pretty much kept us alive uh, on the savannah. So it's very powerful and it's mm -hmm. uh, something that we need to be more mindful of. It's no longer just a matter of replacement therapy and off on your merry way. We do need to make that um, the extra effort. And, and, and it, you know, it can be extremely time consuming. If you look at, um, you know, just that was just one with this particular case study, one cue was her friend. She would have had another 10 at least um, along with her smoking. So it's, it's simultaneously breaking down these incredible super neural highways um, quite strategically and specifically over you know, a somewhat prolonged period of time. Um, it's about, I guess, also um, getting the, the individual to invest in that and recognise that it's well worth their while to do that. When we do do it, that's when we really see long-term sustained recovery. That's when we see remission of decades. That's when an individual can finally say, I can pretty much go about and do anything I want and I'm no longer terrorised by these, these cravings. They're fleeting at best. Um, so I, I think, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the old AA, but there's a particular concept called white knuckling. Um, and white knuckling means that the individuals are sim simply hanging on, uh, they eventually fatigue and relapse. So again, the individual is not actually working on any of those, those cue associations whatsoever. It's just sort of sheer, sheer grit that they uh, stay sober until they can just no longer do it anymore. Uh, and so these cue associations are for anything, even if it's sugar, which is more addictive than cocaine. If you're a person who just keeps having that chocolate, well, we do the same thing. If you're, you know, if you're a person who has to have that particular piece of equipment at the gym and you, you have to have it when you, you know no one else can be on it we do the exact same thing and so you can appreciate it can be quite complex and difficult to do because we're not with that person 24 7 we're having to sort of establish the hierarchy tell them how it's going to work and then we hope that they go out there and they do it um, so it's fraught with just the human condition and that's why we have huge amount of relapse for so many different addictions um, but we're, we're, we're going to work with what we have. We've got to work with how we know the brain. I, I do want to say, though, Melinda, that um, some of these Q exposure conditions are actually imposed on our smokers now. They they yes. used to yes. be able to smoke on the bus or smoke, where you know, in public right. um, or in ve venues now, which they're not no longer allowed to do. So it's been banned. So it's been imposed on them. And what I like to describe to the smoker is what about those ones where you used to always smoke in the restaurant and now you don't or you used to get on the bus and smoke all the time and now you don't or, or in the house like we know that 85 percent of people smoke outside but so how are you managing that oh yeah i can do that all right yeah. why do you think you can do that all right well, well the answer to that is that they do that a lot they get on the bus a lot and can't smoke so it's frequency that frequency you're you're talking about the first day, gosh, this might be hard, but then they've had to do it. They're absolutely obliged to um, go to work, can't smoke at the desk, can't, can't do it here, can't do it there. All of that actually is to their advantage. That's right. And it's certainly an advantage to us because we're likely to see a lot less Q exposure. That's right. With nicotine because it's so restricted now compared to what it was 15 years ago. Yes. Um, I mean, some of that can be can be spoken to by way of um, anticipatory dopamine activity, but nonetheless, that is still um, that is still subject to extinction and you can actually eradicate that quite nicely. Um, so at the end of the day, it, it comes down to replacement therapy and uh, unpairing of, of your cues. That's your, that's your formula. Um, but it, it just can, it just means that there's a bit of extra work that needs to happen because those cues can be incredibly subtle uh, and um, and many. Uh, there are some people that have many of them. And uh, if 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 they're there, they will elicit a drive state uh, if they're not managed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I guess that's a segue to talk about pharmacotherapies a little bit here, because pharmacotherapies have that advantage of taking the edge off those right. yep. significant urges. You know, if you're yep. if you're with somebody or you've got a stimulus to smoke, or there is. And by the way, can I add stressors as being stimuli, a stressor, 
which is a sort of an amorphous thing. I feel really, I'm really upset by, by you know, be, be it the bill I've just had or the fight I've just had with my, um, my partner. Some, a stressor like that is in itself, that negative affect is a, is a um, cue to smoke. Because yeah, you pair that with cigarette. Kind of sympathetic arousal, for example, that's right. And then it's associated with the cigarette. So then you, oh, I'm going to relax now. Yeah. Well, if we give people pharmacotherapies like NRT, you're saying all, all, all the others, it's not just NRT, of course, we, we give people um, varenicline or lots mm -hmm. of other combinations of other things. It takes the edge off it. That's right. Yep. And and yep. I um, I like to tell people about that. And for years, I've, I've made a little cartoon, I think, from Lynn. Melinda knows about this cartoon about the swimming pool of life. I don't know if you know this. I've got this little cartoon I give to people. And that's the, the idea is that um, you, you, you learned how to swim. Most people in Australia have learned how to swim. They used to use floaties, right? And they um, uh, jump in the water. And it's really, if you didn't have a floaty, you wouldn't, you'd probably sink. You need something to keep you buoyant until you're learning how to swim. I'm, I'm making sort of science here at swimming, right? And then after a while, you can throw the floaties away and you're swimming, right? So I've, I've called this pretty lame thing. I've called it the swimming pool of life, right? So if you're trying to learn how to be without a cigarette, it, you're learning in the swimming pool of life. You're not using floaties, you're using pharmacotherapy. So imagine your patches or your tablets are keeping you afloat while you learn how to swim in the swimming pool of life. Right? As I said, it's pretty lame, but, but the idea is after a while, you, people get this because they picture it themselves. Yeah, I, I can swim without these things and you'll learn how to be without these treatments. You don't need pharmacotherapies, but you, it helps you Absolutely. as you're learning. Yep. I always say to people, it affords you a window of opportunity to, to um, basically rewire the brain in a, in a way that's a lot more comfortable than if you were going to do it without so yeah. by all means replacement therapy whether it be um uh, patches or pharmacotherapy it's a necessity an absolute necessity while we're then exposing the individual to the cue um uh to, to the cues because it's an incredibly neurally uncomfortable situation to be in so if you think about anything that either uh, affects the, um, the neural networking or, you know, uh, back in the day, beta blockers have been used quite a bit. So things that sort of, um, I guess, put a lid on the, on the sympathetic and central nervous system so that it can't spike, uh, have all found to be somewhat successful because, again, as you're saying, it takes the edge off as the person's able to just tolerate the exposure more. So the, the, the rewiring continues underneath that, which is the good news. Um, and so at the moment, as we're saying, we're looking at the use of CBD oil, for example, it is indicated in addictions. We're founding specifically uh, very much so with alcohol, which is interesting. So we're finding that when we're giving people um, uh, up to about a mil or per day dose of um, the cannabis oil, what we're finding is that it, it acts as a fairly strong anaerobic in addition to a central nervous system relaxant. And so they're less distressed they're, they're in an exposure situation and they'll say you know it's still um, uncomfortable but it's not like it was without that and so they can actually as a result expose for longer which means that we're doing a rewiring faster which means it's something that could take this case of, of discussion 12 weeks we're finding is able to be reduced to like eight which when you think in terms of, of, of recovery that's massive that's that's really significant so well worth keeping an eye on those studies because um, you know it may well turn out to be something that we can use um, you know in, in conjunction with exposure. So as Renee is saying, you, you know, kind of I guess throw everything you've got at them, you know, all the replacement therapy, the pharmacotherapy, if CBD oil starts to work, let them have that. And you know, so that you can get through this exposure period, um, as you can appreciate can can be very lengthy and people can just lose energy and interest in, in and as you're saying you're saying some of these cues are really subtle aren't they they it can be literally the, the room you're in uh you know if you go to your mum's place and and she doesn't like you smoking um then and people ha have no urges to smoke at mum's place or vice versa they only smoke somewhere um and and not 
not somewhere else, uh, which is really quite sophisticated, isn't it? The, the, the room it's itself very, can be um, the, the cue. It's very subtle and not always, none, not all of our patients have the ability to know that. No, and that's what I was saying to Kate, it's got to be a collaborative effort and that is, it's about them telling you, the, you know, how, just tell me about a day in the life of your smoking in addition to you asking lots of other necessary questions so that you can start to, you know, um, cover up and say to people, if I were following you with a video camera, what would I see? Um, and I just want as much detail as possible. And so that, that, that's right. So then we can, we're not going to get all of them, but we'll get the primary cues down and it's a good start. Uh, but I often find that if you could have developed a list of 10 and you're starting at the bottom, as time goes, you're actually adding mm. <laughs> new ones in because you go, ah, that's one we didn't think of before or they've discovered something else. Um, it's, it's just about always making sure that we're, we're checking and rechecking to make sure that we haven't left one out because, um, you know, it just takes one. It takes one that hasn't been uh, unpaired and that person can find themselves buying a pack of cigarettes, which can be, you know, devastating to them. So yeah, what The other interesting thing that you can say to people, you were saying that earlier, um, Melinda, was that ex extracting yourself from, the, from somewhere, how long... I think Kate asked, how long does this last? I had a patient who literally moved to another country and he said, and, and it was Australia, he came from Argentina he, where he smoked yeah, a lot <laughs> and literally arrived in Australia and stopped smoking. Yeah. And he came to see me um, as a student unrelated to this and he was talking about he didn't have any idea how he did that. How was I able to do that? when I was smoking like crazy in, um, you know, where I grew up and now I'm here. It's a very strong no smoking climate here, isn't it? Socially, it's not terribly acceptable. So there's a whole lot of other st stimuli to not do it here compared to where he was, where everybody was doing it everywhere he went all the time. And here, very few people, nowhere to go, completely different climate no acquired cues here at all and was able to just I don't smoke there I do and here I don't and he didn't didn't quite for himself understand how that could happen which is we can understand but um yeah, on a neural level of course it makes sense in fact it's similar to the, the lady who gets pregnant and doesn't smoke through an entire pregnancy oh, right. and the, the, within the half hour of having given yes. birth, they're screaming for a cigarette they're saying I've got to go out and have one mm -hmm. um Anticipatory dopamine is the often the go-to that we go for to explain that. That means that there's just enough, I guess, because you've got those super highways, there's just enough dopamine to hold the person off. You know. So you think that's the cue? Pop the baby? Both. It's, it's a combination of both. The absence of the cues and uh -huh. enough dopamine to, to say, at some point, we will. Yeah, we're just not going to put a time frame on it, you know. And so that, that person can kind of just wait for 20, 30, 40 years and then suddenly go back to Argentina and get off the plane and go, oh, Yeah. <laughs> you know, or the one who has the child and goes, Oh, now I need to smoke. I haven't smoked and, you know, I haven't smoked for nine months. I can just, yeah, I'm just like, time. So it's a combination of absence of cue and the anticipatory dopamine, which is quite a remarkable phenomenon. But that's because these super highways. Uh, have been developed in the first instance. You wouldn't have that anticipatory effect if you hadn't developed that to begin with. So it's a it's very complex. Addiction is is, is quite complex. It's um incredibly um you know has lots of subtleties and and it's very complex. And I think that um it's great that you guys are taking an interest in it because I hope that hope it may be expanded um your view on it or maybe you have a better appreciation for the things that we need to to consider to, to help the individual and hopefully when you um, you yourself can you know even apply it to yourself and recognize that there might be habitual things that you do and have a look at your environment and go wow you know I'm actually setting up my own associations here uh, as well and why you have your certain go-tos and and so forth and and um, you know use as much of that knowledge as you can and as much of the questionnaires that you can uh, to put together a, a, as a thorough as possible uh, formulation that includes everything from acute exposure to pharmacotherapy to NRT um, to because that, that's that's going to help the individual to stop the best really that's that's the best formulation it's 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 not conservative 
We don't want it to be, it's going in quite aggressively. And that's how we need to be with addiction. We've got to go in quite aggressive with treatment um, because we have a small window uh, to kind of get, I guess, for a better term, to get them over that hump so that they're inspired to continue, you know, because some of it comes down to just she inspiration, the person seeing that they're getting some effects and they're saying, oh, you know what, this is worth doing. This is worth continuing. Um, the drop-off, as you know, is, is, is huge. If you have five people, three will drop off. You'll lose three just through to the, to the process. That's um, it's exhausting to them. Can so. I ask a practical question, Melinda in, in, and Renee? In terms of when someone comes to see you for the very first time, where do you start? Like, I'm kind of hearing that you start with pharmacotherapies and the patches and all that, and get them to to reduce those cravings. But do you do that before you then start dealing with these cues? Or I just loved, you know, thinking of someone coming to see you for the first time, the practicalities of how you might see them for eight to 12 weeks, you sort of mentioned before, of how you get started and how far down the track do the cues come in? Well, in my case, I certainly talk about it straight away. And there are some things that we distinctly do on the day. Um, and, and, and for example, I mean, some of them are very straightforward and simple. Um, for example, I insist that everybody who comes, you don't have to quit smoking on the day at all. I tell them that this is going to take about three months. So they don't know how long. They think I'm going to stop today and I'll never smoke again today, as in I've made the decision, I got here, and that's it. Um, and they think once you actually get, I'm going to do some hocus pocus and it'll all happen now. Uh, and the family think that too, by the way. People go home thinking, uh, and the family thinks they've all, okay, they've seen somebody and they'll stop today. Wrong. So we need to explain that this is a process. It does take many months. I tell them exactly what I was saying earlier, that it takes a few months to learn how to behave without a cigarette. But initially, this is what we're going to do. And one of the initial things in this behavioural change for me because you're not having to necessarily stop smoking immediately on the day, but that you do change where you do it. Exactly. If you haven't been smoking outside, you now smoke outside. So you're setting up another queue. You're absolutely right. So we then reset a very restrictive queue, and that is you're outside, you haven't got your phone with you. you, you Correct. You're bored, stupid, but that's where you smoke You from. can't take your coffee out with you. you the back break work. up the pairing. Yeah. And that is on day one. So we haven't said... You can't smoke. No, that's right. You can smoke. These are the circumstances, right? We, I, I don't want people, if they can, almost immediately to not smoke in their car if they've been smoking in their car. How do you break up that pairing? You literally get out of the car. You want to smoke? Fine. You're driving wherever you're going. You pull over. You get out. You smoke. You, put, you And you get back in and you keep driving. You don't do them together. And that's gone within a day, the whole need to smoke in the car business. Because apart from the fact that it's tedious to pull over every time you smoke, um, they drive a lot and smoke. So it's the frequency of that. And the fact that you're, if you're at home, you're doing it outside. Um, it's a frequent thing. They, they have often done it already. And, and this is one of the things we were talking about before, what they've achieved without realizing it. Classic example of, of smoking in an environment and then not is your bedroom. People say, oh no, I, I, sm I smoke in the house. And you ask them, do you smoke in your bedroom? Oh no, not my bedroom. Well, hang on, you smoke everywhere else in the house, like a chimney everywhere else. What's with your bedroom? oh, my bedroom's like my pristine environment and it's dangerous. Do you get an urge to smoke in your bedroom? No. Okay, we're going to make the bedroom the house now. You don't get an urge to smoke in your bedroom. How did that happen? It's because you don't do it there. So we're going to develop this a bit. For, we're going to make your bedroom, we're going to make the whole of your house like your bedroom. And people get that, if you know what I mean. They understand this and they've because they've done it a lot already. If, if it wasn't within their home, it's been at work or it's been on public transport or been in restaurants, they've, they've learnt this already. So you can say fairly um, important things straight away, straight away on the day. 
Yeah, you can, you can certainly start to get some cure exposure on the day. Mm -hmm. so the first thing I look at is, of course, uh, time to first cigarette, how they smoke, um, you know, what they smoke. Is it rollies, unfiltered, filtered, things like that. Um, do a little bit of a, a clinical uh, history in terms of their um, mental health and medications that they're taking and so forth. I I've always identify if there's someone else at home that's smoking that has no desire to quit. So are we up against those chemical cues of someone else that's coming in with nicotine breath or, or you know, smoking in the house. Um, and then the one, the one thing I change immediately is, yeah, the location in the house that they smoke. Um, and, the, and that is usually it's no longer smoking inside. You have to go on the balcony, then you go up the back. It's not that you can't smoke. We're changing your location immediately. In terms of the other cues, uh, restaurants, cafes, and things like that where they can smoke or, or places at work where they can smoke, that's when we'll do hierarchy and that's when we'll do exposure because that's a little bit more challenging. But certainly at home, they're going to go, well, I'm at home and I can smoke. I just have to do it out there. They're more willing to just kind of initiate that immediately. And so what you're doing is you're just subtly breaking down the cues with them smoking in front of the television or they're smoking uh, in the kitchen or something and you're saying it's going to be out, outside, out the back um, and don't take... And then, and then you tell them very quickly... Do not take anything with you because what you don't want to do is set up another queue outside. So there's no phone, there's no drink, there's no book. It's it's a queue that you've stripped right back so that it's, it's the final one that you break. So you're establishing the first and the last queue by having them step outside. So you usually just say, stare at a tree. I really don't care what you do, but you're doing nothing but smoking. You're just going to stand and smoke. There's nothing that goes with you. And usually they can come back and say, I did that all week. You know, I was fine with it. Um, so you, 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 I guess you're building a queue in order to, to start breaking down all the others. And then that's the last queue that you break. And that's that, you know, when you say that, that them smoking in that spot starts to get the exposure, meaning you're there, but you're not smoking. There's no cigarette anymore. Does that make sense? You know, it's, it's extensive. The first intake is there's a lot of question asking, a lot of information gathering. Correct. Thank Can you. I ask a question? Of course. Um, if you don't smoke with your normal cue, is, is it less pleasurable to smoke for the person? Because the, the association is there, but then if they're just staring at a tree and not having their coffee and... A brick wall is a good place. Yeah. Staring yeah. at a brick wall yeah. is and just... The thing is because time passes very slowly. <laughs> so it's, 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 um, it's the perception of things. So they sit there and say, I got kind of bored pretty quickly. Interestingly, people will, um, will notice that usually a person will want a cigarette when they're going into withdrawal and they need to get a top up and they'll go out. And because they've got no distraction, there's no bells and whistles anywhere, uh, they'll often find that they've gone halfway through and gone, oh, I don't really feel like it anymore, it's a bit boring. Because what they're doing is the body's got the nicotine it needs to stave off its withdrawal and the person's just not smoking the rest of it because they're distracted by everything else that they're doing. So interestingly, um, I guess in some regards, it's semi-pleasurable uh, in, in to answer your question. Um, but it's a good little experiment for them to realise that they actually don't need to have the entire cigarette to manage a withdrawal either. So they start to get a bit more conservative about how much, how much they smoke and their carboxyl hemoglobin starts to drop. And they change the way that they smoke too, which is quite effective that way. But if you've got coffee, friends, activities, books, television, they don't even notice that they've smoked the entire cigarette. They haven't clocked mm -hmm. their body, not really needing it. Um, so in answer to your question, it's, it's a semi-pleasurable state because they do stay off withdrawal to a point. Um, Melinda, what I was going to say to you too is that the work that's been done with... Um, virtual reality and graded exposure um, and people adapting that to um, um, I can't remember the term you, you you're a psychologist you know these terms um, where you're imagining it so imagining the circumstances so imagine the, exposure. That's really yeah good. imaginal so you can imagine your situation for example if I don't go to you know, I, I get into trouble when I go to a, a party or I get into trouble when I'm at a wedding and people are, you know, smoking outside and I want to be with them. So this imaginal, is, is that's the term, isn't it? Imagining you're smoking. 
imaginal exposure. Yeah, and imaginal exposure is literally practicing it at home. In it's not as robust as we'd like it to be. It, it, it's virtual reality is a lot more powerful because the brain can't really tell the difference between it being mm. virtual um, or real. Imaginal exposure isn't as popular. Look, I. I would throw any exposure at them if someone's prepared to sit and go through an imaginal exposure. Okay, I'm at the wedding. Mm. I'm trying to imagine absolutely everything. I'm seeing what I'm wearing. I'm sitting at the table. I'm seeing the people around me. If they're willing to go through that process, it, it's only going to help the situation. But the, I guess the gold standard really for getting your clinical results is at the moment you graded systematic exposure. Mm. If a person can afford virtual reality, um, it's excellent, but it's just not available um, no. as much. Um, so at the moment, what we have, um, you know, uh, to use is is the graded exposure, which is better than the imaginal. Yeah, but if someone's if someone's prepared to do it on top of that, that's mm -hmm. that's perfectly fine. But alone, I wouldn't recommend it. It won't get your clinical results that you want. I've just seen a few papers on it. That's what I was alluding to. It's, 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 it's in conjunction with. It's very good. Practicing, yeah, you're practicing your your social situations that are, are not your common ones, the the, yeah. the, the, the least common ones, because you how you know how do you practice this um, or how do you have exposure to something that's a rare event, as it were, but enough of an event for you to worry about it, like a party you're going to. Um, Linda, can I? Else? Yeah, if I can ask a question. Sorry, I don't want to steal everyone else's, but. This is, this is just fascinating to me, this whole association, Q association. Um, I'm wondering, is there any work on um, creating new associations that aren't pleasant? For example, holding your hand in a freezing, you know, bowl of water whilst you're smoking outside, staring at the wall. Doing aversion so, therapy. Yeah. Aversion therapy, yeah. sure. So, so, we used so, to so, do so. it at the clinic, aversion therapy. Oh, it really? Was, okay, so, tell me about that. Yeah, it's... Um, you know what? It's 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 clinically significant, but it is considered to be invasive. <laughs> uh, so what you don't want to do is create another level of trauma or association in doing it for the individual. Um, theoretically, it 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 um, it stands as a potential fast track to rewiring. Uh, but in terms of what we would consider best practice, um, we would say it's too aversive. Um, it's pretty aversive and you can do it with one cigarette. Can I just tell you the technique? The technique is you simply um, smoke a cigarette really quickly, not a whole packet, really not, not, not dozens of them, but one of them really fast. Yeah. And it's very aversive. It's not what smokers normally would do. They'd be relaxed, smoking, dragging, you know, whatever. But you're telling them to smoke, 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 inhale. And what they're doing actually physiologically is hyperventilating. And when you hyperventilate, it makes you very lightheaded, correct? Everybody gets lightheaded. You're blowing off too much CO2. And so you're hyperventilating. And that's what you do with a cigarette. And that's what in the past people did with their kids. They'd get, right, Johnny, I've caught you smoking, you know, and they make Johnny smoke a whole packet or, or, or make until he was nauseated. Yeah, it's nausea right. that's the key. It's nausea that doesn't. You get a person to be nauseated without vomiting. That's, that's it. The highest form of aversion. The brain remembers that uh, very, very well. So you might recall getting sick of a particular, uh, having food poisoning with a particular meal or perhaps had a particular liquor or, or alcohol that you became quite nauseated with and people will say, I still can't look at that, I still can't touch that. Um, yes, so look, if we could per make a person feel incredibly nauseous while smoking or anything, it would work very well, but it's uh, a very invasive, uh, not <laughs> best practice. Um, I about not best practice. Sorry, uh, back to that. I'm not sure about not best practice because there's a quite a it's body of work. It's not to be best practice. It's considered to be quite invasive. So we don't yes. just flooding in terms of exposure. You know, we're going to throw them off a cliff in a in a you know a, an elevator with snakes to cure all three phobias. You know, it, we. Um, <laughs> it actually would brilliantly work. Yes. But the person would sustain psychological um, injury for it. So while you're curing one thing or while you're ameliorating one thing, you're kind of eliciting another. So 
it's because of that that um, despite its effectiveness, people have said, look, I think it's too aversive. It's, 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 it's too um, invasive for psychologically for the individual. But it's a, a great point, Darren. Um, yeah, the studies have been done and um, uh, it, they do work. They've got great significant clinical significance, um, but at a, at a cost where we're not comfortable with uh, the, the cost to the, to, the, to the individual that undergoes it. And look, and we, we don't want to create further stress and trauma. So whether we can, you know, come up with a, <laughs> a better way of make them nauseous, put them to sleep at the same time while they're smoking, if they don't experience it possibly. I mean, you know, look, there's <laughs> combinations of that possibly down the track, you know. Um, yeah. Well, we certainly did it. A, for many, many years in our smokers clinic, for many, oh, many years. Look, it was actually a, a go-to because it um, worked. Yeah. And um, over time, uh, it was just discovered that there were other, you know, the person would walk away having um, had a significant amelioration of that particular phobia or symptom that would later manifest something that, oh, yes. uh, you know, down the track as a result of the treatment. So it... it you know, the golden rule was, look, we probably shouldn't be doing this anymore. Yeah, so. I've got one more question to sum this all up. And this is not an insignificant one. This is a, a major thing because around which there is not a lot of data. The biggest cue our smokers have is the packet of cigarettes itself. Absolutely. So the question I like to ask all of us should be asking is what do we say to a patient do they throw their cigarettes away or do they keep them on the shelf well, you know q exposure would say we keep them um but other people would say well that's a temptation if i have them i'll use them you can just leave keep an em empty packet the idea is you just you do sensitize it or not it itself there has been an empty pack of cigarettes. There's no cigarettes in there, but you know you're just allowing it to be within your environment, and you you know you you're exposing to you know that's what it looks like, that's what it feels like, that's the colour. Mm -hmm. But the cigarette itself, you know, just manipulating things with your hands. People can build cues with that. Um, they can get you know so um, the the inhaler is quite handy for people that have that particular cue they've got something they can play with it's white it's long <laughs> they can put it in their mouth and play with it and and you know but it's not actually um a cigarette it's not administering you know it's they're not mm -hmm. actually smoking so it's breaking down that association so some people with different drugs will actually become have a cue associated with the paraphernalia such as needles or spoons or powder um yeah. So the smell, people will say, for example, you know, cocaine has a particular smell and so they'll actually make an association with that. So depending on the substance itself, yeah, the paraphernalia can be very strong. Um, a lighter, people say, I saw a lighter mm. and thought about having a cigarette. Yeah, that's right. That's Just right. A lighter. Yeah. Part of the, and so we, 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 see a lot of, we see a lot of contradictory advice given in various departments of health and various other sort of lists of what to do. And some of them are not necessarily correct. Can I be no, so good? They are risk aversive. So a lot of people are really risk averse and they panic and they say, well, if, if we say that, you know, a lighter can be in the house, we're really just encouraging them to smoke. Mm. They're not recognising the, the research that says actually what we're helping them to do is rewire. That's right while using other aids which is why we have things such as replacement therapies it's why mm. we have you know buprenorphine and all sorts of different things that we use for different substances we have that because we're allowing this person a window of opportunity to rewire without the the, the, the physical and apart from that it puts them into physical danger but that some substances like alcohol for example um you know by, by stabilizing the, the the body and stabilizing the withdrawal effect and also stabilising the anxiety that comes from that. Um, you know, we, we allow them to, we give them an opportunity to rewire. So often when you have people saying, stay away, don't do this, get rid of that, um, mm. it, it's people who just have an aversion to risk. And we sit a lot in mental health. We sit a huge amount in mental health. People are always worried about, 
suicidal activity, ideation, behaviour, relapse and worried about the ramifications of that versus I think we need to have a very open and honest discussion about, you know, what's real, what works and, you know, it's okay to talk about these things and talk to people about the realities of them and, and, and help them. Basically, I say to people, the whole point of therapy is you need to become your own therapist. You need to be able to work out how these things work for you and go on and keep doing them. Um, so you're right, Renee, these, these, some of these websites or um, pharmacists, you know, the things you find on the packaging and I just put it down to, to people being um, risk averse. They're just worried about whether they're going to contribute to someone's relapse without really recognising that what they're actually doing is that anyway by saying don't do that. That's right. But it is, it is, again, intuitive of a lot of people to think um, personally, you know, or the family says that or, or the, their doctor says that or somebody says, you know, get rid of everything, you know. Yeah. And I, I, I quite like to, as you say, um, have, have it there, put it away, empty pack it in the freezer as an example. You can put them in the freezer. So you have them but don't have them. Put yeah. them in the boot of the car um, yeah. so that you have them but don't have them. In a sense, you have both, both ways, as it were, so that people don't get intimidated by it. And people do get very nervous about the idea of throwing their cigarettes away, makes them anxious. And anxiety is something we don't want to elicit. We don't want people anxious that they don't have them there. So it's That's a right. bit of a rock and a hard place. They do get rid of all that anyway. Eventually, they, they'll come in and say, oh, I'll just throw everything away because I'm fine with it now. Yeah. That's so, right. Eventually, it just gets yeah, important covered in dust or whatever anyway supermarket and you know and see the ray of, of um different packaging and not it doesn't uh, elicit a cue that's yeah. the most important thing yeah. so i guess um for all the students out there again i'm i'm really happy that you're, you're here tonight because it tells me that there's more people out there who know about this now and that means that people who are suffering from addiction have a better than fighting chance the more there are of you the more likely that we're going to be able to help them to help themselves um, and the idea is that you need to be a little courageous because, um, you know, we, some of what we're doing is a little bit frontier um, and you just need to sort of, you know, stick with the science, do what is best practice, but also be a bit courageous and say, well, yeah, actually this person does need to kind of expose to this. We shouldn't just be saying stay away from this, stay away from this. We need to say actually we're going to very systematically and carefully expose you to this so that you can be near it and it won't bother you anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and and be counterintuitive in that regard and look we have a great community of professionals out there reach out talk to people two heads are better than one sometimes when it comes to treatment formulation um and and don't be afraid to i guess don't be afraid to really um get into the thick of it and um you know throw everything you can at them because that's going to be better for the individual um i hope that made sense getting late in the night. It's all been fantastic. Thank, Thank you so very much. Um, everybody, I've, you know, if, if we could put our hands together, we would clap and say thank you so very much. Thank you very much. It's been